Thank you, Gilles. And again, we'll hold the questions until we have uh, all the speakers from this session. Um, our next presenter is Dr. David Ullman. He, uh, he is a doctor of mechanical engineering uh, at Ohio State University. Or, uh, or, he, or again, come on. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. You got your degree from Ohio State University, your PhD, your BS, and your MS at aeros uh, aerospace engineering from. I'm, re I'm reading your words. I know. Well, this is what you sent me. <laughs> he's, a, he's an emeritus professor at Oregon State University. And um, I, a keynote speaker at the 2018 Sustainable Aviation S uh, Symposium on Electric Air Vehicle Performance Mechanical Design Process, um, and author of What Will Your Grandchildren See When They Look Up? Please welcome David Ullman. I want to talk about Eastall. Um, thank you. Uh, I was really glad you asked that question earlier. We didn't uh, reverse it. Thank you. Yeah, I'll pay you later. Uh, <laughs> I've been to the Uber conferences. I really appreciate what Uber's doing. They've set a hill to go up. They're taking people with them. I'm just not convinced it's the right hill. So the theme of this presentation is basically what I just said. We're going to look at Eastall a little bit. I'm going to do a very short version. I've got a longer version Monday morning uh, in one of the forum sessions at 10 o'clock. Plus, I have a booth in the Innovation Showcase. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, Brian Seeley showed this slide some years ago, and the first time I saw it, I said, wow, that's, that's really impressive. I'm, I'm a pilot. I can't take off in 430 feet. But I began to think about this some more, and, and uh, the more I look at this and the more I play with this topic, the more I think it is realistic. And I, especially when I see the, these Uber structures that they're proposing, that they're, uh, the people that are working with them proposing, this is not a whole lot larger. And, you know, maybe there's really something about this, this e-stole possibility. And that's what I want to look at with you for the next few minutes. Next slide. This doesn't work. Okay, so let's go next slide. Let's start with this. This is clearly not a practical vehicle. This is a little cub. Little cub either holds a record right now or did last year. Uh, it changes. Um, it can take off and land in about 20, 25 feet. It takes great pilot skill. Go to the next slide, please. But it, consider this little formula here, and this is basically the landing distance, uh, S sub G, and um, it's really a, a function of three things. It, and uh, it's a function of the weight over the area, the wing loading. It's a function of thrust to weight, and it's a function of what kind of lift coefficient you can get when you take off. And uh, next slide, please. And so there's only three ways to make this work better. You either lower the wing loading by getting the weight out. Well, when you look at the picture of the little cub, they've gotten all the weight out of that they can. They have a big, huge wing on the thing. You raise the thrust. I'm pretty sure that thing's nitrous. They blast nitrous into that when he takes off. Uh, or you raise the, the lift coefficient on takeoff. And plus, you need an awful lot of pilot skill. Next. So, Little Cub's done all these things, but this is not a practical vehicle, not for what we're talking about. So go to the next slide, please. So a really interesting, I just found this on the web the other day, and um, this is a zero to 60 time for an automobile. And there's two curves on there, one's internal combustion engine, the other's different forms of electric vehicles. And electric vehicles do much better, and that's because you can get torque immediately. You can get the power on the, on the road very, very quickly. Um, next slide. Uh, also, I noticed the other day where Tesla uh, came out with their new, their new Roadster, which will do 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds. It's totally off this plot. So using an electric motor to get a lot of thrust into the air, you can, you can, outdo, you can outdo an IC engine really, really well. I'm really surprised I haven't seen anybody do it yet. But it'll, it'll happen. Next slide, please. So this is basically a real simple formula for how much thrust you can get in the air. And as you can see, it's a function of the power. Wow, we've got the power now. So uh, the area of the prop and the air density. And so all you do is you need, you need some really herky batteries that you can suck a lot of power out of really quickly. 
You need a really powerful motor. You need a large high pitch prop. And voila, you can beat Little Cup. So next slide. So it's easily doable. Do it again. And I'm just surprised we haven't seen this yet, and we will see it in the near future. Uh, I'm not interested in that. Go to the next slide. I want to look at what can you do with the lift coefficient on takeoff. And so I've spent the last four years looking into this. Next slide. So I want to increase the lift coefficient on takeoff using, I like three-letter acronyms. I was in the military for a while. Um, and uh, we want to use distributed electric propulsion using PAI. PAI is, is uh, propulsion airframe interaction. Go a couple more. And what this basically means is, is can you use the air coming off the propulsion to do some really interesting things with the aerodynamics? And one of the things that drives me crazy about all these VTOL guys is they're just blasting air around. They're not making good use of the air. And there's some really clever things you can do. And I've spent the last few years looking into one of them, and I'm not saying my solution's the right solution. I just picked one and ran with it, and, you know, I think it's promising. And what you can do is you can think about, you can mold the air. You can mold the air to do what you want with the propulsion. And we've never had this capability before. Distributed electric propulsion allows us to do this, and very few people are looking at it. So I went off into the upper surface blowing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. It starts with Custer. Okay, and those of you that are not familiar with Custer, Willard Custer started playing around with this stuff right after World War II, and one of his first successful airplanes was the Custer Channel Wing II, which you see here. And what he's basically doing is sucking the air over a semicircular airfoil, and in, in his words, it's the speed of the air, not the airspeed because most of the lift comes from the top surface of the wing, and if you can double the air speed over the top surface of the wing, you can greatly increase the lift coefficient. And here's a nice diagram of him in a static situation, not moving forward. It changes some when you have forward motion. Next slide. I really like this picture. This is a picture of the Custer Channel Wing 2. It's tied to a post, and you might notice the wheels are off the ground. Yeah, think about that for a second. Okay, now there's some cheating going on here, because I analyzed this. I said, this can't be. This can't be. And sure enough, it can't. First of all, there's no pilot. So he's already, already dropped some weight here. Uh, and second of all, I'm fairly sure he had at least a 20-knot headwind, because there's no other way this pencils out that this could be. But it shows the capability, the possibility, of playing with the air with the propulsion system and getting some really high lift at very low speed. Next slide, please. Later, he went on to build the Custer Channel Wing 5, which actually still exists, but it's sitting outside rotting right now, unfortunately. Uh, and if you stop by my booth, I have some videos of both the Custer Channel Wing 2 and the Custer Channel Wing 5 taking off and landing, and it is fairly amazing. You go on from there, and you go to the YC-14, and what the YC-14 did was use the jet engine. It's over the top surface of the wing. It's creating a, a higher lift coefficient. Excuse me. I have a video of that in the booth also. And this thing can literally jump off the ground where a comparable, uh, this is a 170,000 pound vehicle, and it can get off in, in 800 feet and get back on in 800 feet where a comparable gross weight aircraft will take 2,200 feet. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Then there's the QSRA. Uh, if any of you ha know anybody that was involved in the QSRA project, I'd love to talk to them. I can find very little literature on it, and um, I'd like to know more about it. They spread it out even more. They have four jet engines on that. I have no idea what speed the aircraft's going in this photo. The wheels are down, the flaps are down. You can see where the flow goes around, sticks to the, to the uh, flaps. Uh, I suspect he's moving really, really slow here. I don't know the velocity. Um, but a really interesting one. Go to the next slide and cl click down three more, if you would, please, since I don't have control over this. So if you sort of diagram this out, Custer used this scallop thing with, with, with one internal combustion engine on each side. The YC-14 had a jet engine on each side. The, the QSRA 
had two jet engines, spread it out some more. And so we have a project we're calling IDEAL. I can never remember what IDEAL means, so I have to read it off of here. The integration is distributed electric propulsion to augment lift. And so what we're doing is using little ducted fans, lots of them along the leading edge, specifically designed to increase the velocity of the air over the top surface of the wing. And we have a patent on this. And the reason I show this is because it's a fairly good diagram of uh, a, a patent diagram of what such an airplane might look like. And indeed, we, wait a minute, don't go, don't go. You went too quick. <laughs> Sorry. Um, another really interesting thing about doing this is you can start playing with the lift distribution over the span of the wing. And if you look at that diagram, figure 10 from the patent, you can actually increase the, the, not only the thrust, but the lift on one part of the wing, and you basically got an aileron. Or you can do some gust alleviation, or you can do some side wind alleviation. You're molding the air through the propulsion system. Now, thank you. So there's all kinds of ways of doing this. This is just some diagrams out of the, out of the patent. The very bottom one, which is basically a ducted fan on a pylon, we've played around with a lot. And next slide, please. Um, I won't spend much time going into this, but there's actually a fairly firm underlying theory for what's happening here. And we verified the theory with some experiments I'll show you in just a second. But basically, you can reduce this down to the little equation you see there, which is the lift coefficient is just a function of the velocity on top of the wing, VT, versus the free stream velocity. So in other words, if you can double the velocity on top of the wing, you can increase the lift coefficient by something in the order of two, whatever that constant happens to be in front of it. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. This is way, way too simple. The reason I went into engineering, the reason I taught engineering for 35 years was because if you begin to understand something, you can get it simple enough, you can explain it to people, and it works. Keep going. Next slide. So in order to verify this, we built a wind tunnel. Uh, I've been building wind tunnels since I was 12, and it seemed like the right thing to do. So this is an 18-foot long wind tunnel. Next slide. And there's our test section, and you can see a model airfoil in there with ducted fans on the front. And the reason I show you this is science is not always pretty, uh, but this is fully instrumented. We, we, we read lift, drag, pitching moment, anything you want, and it's all uh, dumped into a database um, uh, for analysis. Next slide. Here, here's a uh, model we were just working on recently where we're playing around with what, how, how the air sticks to the flaps, coanda effect for even getting higher lift coefficients. You can see there's four ducted fans on there. Uh, the reason we were doing four ducted fans, um, we were working with little 50 millimeter fans, which are very weak, but so four of them not only gives me fairly good flow all the way across the full span of the wing, but I can get enough um, difference to actually um, get good measurements. It works pretty well. We have an example of this in the booth we can show you. This is really the key thing. That little simple formula I showed you, this is uh, experimental data versus that formula. Uh, and we, this is with different angles of attack, different flap angles, and it really works. If you can up the speed on the top of the wing, you can up the lift coefficient. It's that simple. And, and it, it's almost proportional. So this is something to think about. This is a NASA 4414, which is basically the airfoil on our test vehicle. Uh, standard curve at the bottom, you can see CL0, that's the lift coefficient at zero velocity, or zero angle of attack. CL alpha is the curve slope. CL max is how high you can get. So plane wing is the, the figure on the bottom. Our wind tunnel data is the figure on the top. Notice that not only is CL0 like doubled, but the lift, the lift curve slope is greatly increased. And I quit testing at 20 degrees angle of attack, and we're still going up slightly. So CL max is somewhere in the range of, of uh, twice what it could have been. And this is just for one situation without, and these are, these little ducted fans I'm using, by the way, are off the shelf model airplane bits. So this is nothing real sophisticated. 
Keep going. So I'm a great believer in I don't believe anything until I see it and feel it. So this is my rebuilt Jabru, which is registered as an EAB, so I can do experiments on it. And here we have four ducted fans on it. These are 120 millimeter ducted fans. We have a full battery system in it. Um, it did its first test flight about two weeks ago, and so we don't have any good data out of it. This is not, these four ducted fans will not fly this airplane. They only give me uh, a step in knowledge that or, or there's enough difference that I can measure the difference with our onboard instrumentation and tell how they're affecting the lift and the thrust. Next slide. Uh, we've got a little, since this is a Burt Rutan year, we designed a little Burt Rutan airplane, which we have a model of in the, in the booth that you can come see and, and play with. Go to the next slide. I want to wrap these up. The key points here is VTOL is really, really cool. I picked on the black fly here only because it was really easy to compare to. I happen to be in my booth's right across from black fly, which ought to make this really interesting. Um, but if you look at the takeoff distance, the black fly obviously has a zero takeoff distance. If you look at the power required in terms of kilowatts, it's a little over 250. If you look at an Eastol that's sized for an ultralight, you can you can still get off in in uh, 40, 50 feet with one what one fifth the power. Why are you doing the vertical? I don't know. Next slide. For Uber, 4,000 pound gross, five people on board. You get about the same thing. Okay, so. It's going to take, and the, the thrust is around 5,000 pounds because you need um, a factor of 1.1, 1.2 times the, um, the weight for an air, uh, uh, a vertical takeoff. And, um, you know, 150, 150 uh, feet, you can get a, uh, a stole type aircraft off the ground. Next slide. Range. The green is current batteries. 150 watt hours per kilogram, specific uh, energy. The batteries I'm using in my Jabberwatt are only 120 because of the chemistry I'm using, but 150 is reasonable. 2023 batteries are 230. This is the numbers that Uber's are using. Uh, 2040, I estimate, hopefully will be up to, to 400. And if you look at the top uh, figure with the ultralight comparison, you can see the black fly ranges versus the, uh, uh, the ranges of, of our type, uh, uh, Eastol type aircraft. And if you look at the one on the bottom, the Uber type, the VTOL versus the ideal for the 4,000 pound vehicle, and you can see the ranges are vastly, vastly different. So um, VTOL takes a lot of power, takes a lot of energy. Uh, even a lot of the VTOL manufacturers are giving numbers now for if we take off vertically, we have upwards of half the range if we take off as a traditional airplane. Um, problematic, because batteries aren't there, and they're coming slowly, and even as they come, you're still going to be very range limited. So, next slide. So that's my pitch for Eastol. Um, hopefully, I've thrown down enough gauntlets here that some of you will come talk to me, either in the Innovation Showcase, or again, at 10 o'clock on Monday morning, I'm giving a longer version of this with some videos and stuff and a picture of the Jabber, well, a film of the Jabberwot in, in the air. And uh, thank you for your attention.